Oh. So, regularly in this church, we celebrate something called communion. Without fail, most Sundays, we break bread with each other. Communion finds its origin in the Old Testament. It finds its origins in the Passover. And that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. Colin, I wonder if you could share the screen, please. We're going to be looking at that tonight. So the Passover is our subject this evening. It's one of the five feasts of the Bible. One of the five feasts. So we've got Passover. We have unleavened bread, which is the second. And then the third is the Feast of First Fruits, or the Feast of Weeks of Pentecost. Feast of Trumpet, which is four, or day, and Day of Atonement. And then five tabernacles and booths. Passover and unleavened bread are intertwined, but we're not going to be looking at unleavened bread tonight, okay? We'll just be concentrating on Passover. So let's get to Passover. As you can see from the PowerPoint, we have a little bit of reading to do tonight, but Colin's going to put it up on the screen if you don't have yeah, your Bible with you this evening. So if you do have your Bible, let's turn to Exodus 12, and we'll read 1 to 32, and then put your finger in Matthew 26. As well. So Colin's going to put that up on the screen for us. So let's read together. We'll start with Exodus 12, 1 to 32. It's a lengthy reading, but it will do us no harm to read the word of God. None at all. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that it is in the tenth day of this month. Every man shall take a lamb according to the father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbour, nearest neighbour, shall take, shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male year old. You may take it, from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill the lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts, and you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I pass over you. No plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven or leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly. And on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done in those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month, at evening you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a sojourner or a native in the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. 
and touch the lintel and two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. I mean, he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it's a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. He passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt. And he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel. Go and serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. If we turn to Matthew 26, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to read verses 17 to 19, and then we're going to go 26 through 30. So Matthew 26, beginning at 17. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Then we'll go down to verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it gave it to the disciples and said, take it, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup when he had given them, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of its fruit. I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives. And may the Lord bless the public reading of his word to us today. Before we get any further, brothers and sisters, let's pray together. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're here this evening in your house and in your day. Father, I ask for open minds, open ears and open hearts to what you would say to us all this evening. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, I intend to deal with the Old Testament and the New Testament separately. So, I'll split it into two, hopefully. Let's give it a second. Yes, there we go. What led to and what is Passover and what is your Passover today? So, what led to and what is Passover and secondly, what is your Passover today? So, let's get to our first section. What led to and what is Passover? Israel's history with Passover finds its origins some 1800 years before Christ. It starts with Jacob and his sons, and one son in particular, Joseph. You have to go all the way back to Genesis 37. I'm not going to delve into that this evening. I'm not going to get into that whole story. But suffice to say, Israel became slaves to Egypt for 400 years. The Israelites cry out to God, and he hears them. And he hears them. And he sends Moses and his brother Aaron to lead them out of Egypt. From Exodus 7, Moses and Aaron start to plead with Pharaoh to release the nation of Israel, the Jews, from their bondage. To cut a long story short, Pharaoh was never going to let this happen. Not willingly anyway. From Exodus 7 verse 14, we see the first of ten plagues. That will hit Egypt. Now the first three plagues affect the whole land. So what were the first three plagues? So we've got water to blood, 
frogs and gnats. Okay? So we see the first three plagues affect the whole land. Plague four, which is the plague of flies, we start to see a change. We start to see a change. The Jews are based in the land of Goshen. Everywhere in Egypt except Goshen is plagued by flies. Only the Egyptians are affected. God is now starting to separate his people from the Egyptians. There's now a clear and obvious distinction. God's people and the Egyptians. Very clear now. Each plague thereafter progressively gets worse. The fifth plague, all Egyptian livestock die. The sixth is Egyptians breaking out. It makes my skin crawl and festering boils. It doesn't sound pleasant, does it? But it's not just humans here. The animals are suffering as well. The seventh is hail. And how destructive and deadly was that? The eighth is locust. They ate every piece of plant life that was in front of them. Nothing was spared. Nothing. Destroying crops, trees, grass, bushes, whatever was in front of them. The ninth plague. Egypt is plunged into darkness for three days. No moonlight, no starlight. Such was the depth of the darkness you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And during all of these events, Moses and Aaron are pleading with Pharaoh to let the nation of Israel, the Jews, go and worship God. happened up until now has been bad well you're about to see nothing you're about to see nothing some nothing short of draw dropping at the very least Alex Matier in his commentary called what happens next as the impotent king and the sovereign lord the impotent king and the sovereign lord now in chapter 11 this is what Matier calls the preface it's the beginning of the preparation for the Passover. God is telling Moses what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Here is where we see the sovereignty of God come through. God does exactly what he says he will do. Chapter 11 is completely dedicated to introducing the 10th plague it's funny, when I was studying for this, I never actually saw this as a plague. I saw this as just the, the nation of Israel being freed from their bondage. But when you get into it, it is a plague. But now my eyes have been opened to how serious this actually is. I just saw this in the past, reading it. Oh, that's Israel being released from their bondage. That's great. And now they're going to be God's people in their own right. No servants, no people. But this is truly a plague. What's about to happen? This is not going to be nice. Nothing pleasant is happening here. So the tenth plague, the Passover. It's telling us also though, it's not going to be pleasant. But it's a new beginning. It's a new start. All of this against a king, Pharaoh, who is completely impotent. All his wise men, all his magicians, all his armies... Etc. can do nothing against a holy, a holy and just God. There is nothing in their arsenal that can fire back at God. They have nothing. David in Psalm 33 and 9 reiterates what God says, what God does. Let me read it to you. Psalm 33 and 9. For he spoke, it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. But what is it that God's going to do? Let's go back into Exodus 4. Exodus 11 and we'll read verses 4 to 7. It's a wee reminder. So Moses says, Thus says the Lord, At midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill. And the firstborn of cattle, 
There will be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor will ever be again. Nor a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. This brings us now to the Passover. And now we see the Jews involved. Up to this point, they've been separated from all the plagues, part one, two, and three. But from four to nine, no human involvement thus far. No personal involvement. They had nothing to do but to watch and wait. But now they are involved. Now they have to be doing. Now there'll be some responsibility. This is personal responsibility now. Up until this point, God has been patient with Egypt. Allow me to read 2 Peter to you. 2 Peter 3.9 9 says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That all should reach repentance. Tells us how patient God is. He is gracious to Israel. Let me take you into Isaiah 13, 18. Isaiah 13, 18 says this. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are those who wait for him. Right up until now, Israel has had every opportunity to repent. They have been shown patience. They have been shown grace. What God has done up to now has been small in comparison to what he's about to do. Now we come to the nitty gritty. Chapter 12. Chapter 11 tells us what's, what's going to happen. Chapter 12 is actually where it happens. The instruction from God is clear. We've read it together already. They have to paint the doorposts and lintels of their homes with the blood of a year old perfect lamb. Personal responsibility kicks in here. There's also the Passover meal to be eaten in preparation for what is to happen next, which will be the Exodus. At midnight, God is going to pass over the land of Egypt and he will visit every home, every home, no exception. If the doorposts and lintels are not painted in the blood of a lamb, then the firstborn of every home will die, human and animal. And this, and here is where we see the faith of the Jews in God come through. Please allow me to quote Matthias here. The essence of faith is the trust that obeys. And this was the point to which Israel came in Exodus 12. Knowing unmistakably how great was the power of the enemy, equally aware of their own weakness and helplessness, yet ready to put all on bare obedience to the command and promise of God. <coughs> who does that remind you of? Ready to put all on bare obedience to the command and promise of God. They have put all that they are and have on the blood of the Lamb. They see their safety in the blood of the Lamb. Nothing is going to harm them because of the blood of the Lamb. When I was studying for this, it reminded me of an old Tim. An old Tim. I can see a smile on somebody's face. She knows where I'm going with this. It's a hymn book we don't sing from very often. But you'll all know it. It's a favourite of mine, in fact. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would your evil or victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. So the only place they see their safety in is in the blood of the Lamb. Nothing could possibly have them because of the blood of the lamb. Their faith in God and what he said he's going to do for them has in effect saved them. But how does that work? 
How can the blood of the lamb be so powerful? And the key here is the lamb. Someone in every house in Egypt, every house in Egypt was affected, and I mean every house, even with the Israelites, there was someone or something in the Jewish homes dead. The lamb was dead. It was brought into the homes as the main part of the Passover meal. The lamb has taken the place, the substitute of the firstborn. That actually, that was a sobering thought for me. Because if this was to happen today, and I wasn't a believer, I'm the firstborn of Felix Selina. I find that quite sobering. So I did. So it was a substitute for the firstborn. The lamb's blood and the lamb was their salvation. It was their substitute. This would later carry on as the nation was given the law by Moses from God. On the day of atonement, the blood of the lamb would be used to cover the sins of the nation of Israel. And as we move on, it's worth remembering that the Passover was a once only event, never, never to happen again. But it's to be celebrated, remembered annually with the Passover meal. Since that day, the Jews have celebrated Passover. And we do also, but not quite the way that our Jewish friends do. And this leads me to our second section this evening. What is our Passover today? What is our Passover today? Well, let's remind ourselves. Let's go back into Matthew 26. I'm going to read those verses again. It was a while ago, and it'd be good to remind ourselves of them. So Matthew 26, 7 to 19, and then we'll read 26 to 30. Now, in the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And then down to verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of, of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it, drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of olives these passages that we have just read bring us to the most important week in christendom they bring us to holy week they bring us to holy week from the triumphal entry all the way through to holy thursday good friday and then easter sunday this is the context in which these passages sit if we don't place scripture in its proper context we miss what's there and see what's not. I've said this before. In other words, if you take the text out of the context, what are you left with? You're left with a con. Now, as I said, all Jews celebrated the Passover meal. It was a remembrance of the suffering in and their liberation from Egypt. As Bartley points out, the Passover feast was a commemoration of deliverance, and what a deliverance it was. It's clear from verses 17 to 19, Jesus had prepared in advance for this day. He is the Son of God. He knows what's coming. He's there in obedience to his Father. What the disciples are preparing for is what they think is Passover. It will more commonly be known as the Last Supper. If you go back to Exodus 12, you will see strict guidance on how it will be treated from generation to generation. So there's a lot of work to be done by the disciples in preparation, and they get on with it. And they get on with it. Now we move to the meal itself. In verses 26 to 29, the meal was to take a twist that the disciples could not have expected. They couldn't have expected it. It would be the beginnings of their world being turned upside down. 
Quite simply put, Jesus himself was about to become the Passover lamb. As the original Passover was a new beginning for the Jewish nation, so Jesus would become the Passover lamb for all mankind, not just the Jews. But the Jews shouldn't be surprised by this. But if you go into Isaiah, what is it he said about the temple? This house will become a house of prayer for all nations. This should not be a surprise to the Jews that Jesus was here for all men. This should not be new to them. So, as well as it being a new beginning, we can't forget, we can't miss, it would be remiss of me if I did not say, it was also a judgment. It's a judgment by God. On one hand, it's a happy event for the Jewish nation, but God's judgment and wrath is also here as well. We can't miss that. We can't just swipe it away to make it all nice and warm and fuzzy. Judgment and salvation are both here in the one act, and Jesus would soon enact on that. The spilling of Jesus' blood on the cross marks the new covenant between God and mankind. Hebrews 9 and 22 is very clear in this. Let me read it to you. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If you read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it's all there. Jesus has come to be our sacrificial lamb. He's come to be our own personal Passover. And the symbolism is thick here. The disciples will no doubt have questions. Maybe the world's been turned upside down here. Are we actually to eat his body and actually drink his blood? For one denomination, that's exactly what they believe. Sincerely, but that's what they believe. Well, clearly not. Jesus is instituting what we now call communion, which we celebrate here regularly. It's a remembrance, as you'll see written in Luke's gospel. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread, a symbol of the body broken for us, and the cup, a symbol of his blood spilt to cover the sins of man. Now for the sharp among you, and I know you're all sharp, you will have realized that Jesus and the disciples are celebrating Passover a day early. You see, they should be celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the Jewish calendar. The Jewish calendar is 14 Nisan. Passover begins the following day at 6 p.m., which is 15 Nisan. Let's see where the symbolism explodes. Allow me to quote Michael Green here because I couldn't put this any better than he has. What he says is absolutely fantastic. No mention is made of any lamb at the Last Supper. Is this because, as many of the church fathers thought, that Jesus himself was the lamb and his death superseded all, the Passo- all that the Passover lamb stood for? Or is it the case that Jesus celebrated and anticipated Passover a day early, a private meal with his disciples? That would explain why there is no lamb. They had to be ritually killed in the temple. It would also make sense of John's chronology, which you'll find in chapter 13, verse 1, 1828 and 1914, which would seem to indicate that Jesus died in the afternoon at the end of 14 Nisan, when the Passover lambs were being killed in the temple. A graphic symbolism indeed. Now when I read that, my wee mind exploded and I just went, wow. When I read that for the first time, when I read that, my jaw dropped. The penny finally dropped. I had an epiphany at that point. Many of you know I was brought up in a Catholic church. And on Good Friday, we would have mass at three o'clock. Why three o'clock? How can you know just have mass at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and let us go on with the rest of our day? As I used to think as a boy. No, there's a reason for that. Because that was the time when Jesus was hung on the cross and that was the time in the temple when they slaughtered the lambs. Are we getting this? Christ was on the cross on the 14th Nisan when the lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. When the blood was being spilt. That's when his blood 
was being spilt. Well, my wee mind just went mental. The penny finally dropped as to why we were there at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. There was another one time in the 31 years that I've been a Christian, 31 years back in the 5th of June, actually, if you want to know the date. You probably don't. It was when I went to the Glow Night School. Mark Davis who stood at this pulpit on many an occasion and he was going through Luke. And he was coming to that part in Luke where Mary said, my God and my saviour. My world opened at that point. She's not perfect. She's just an ordinary mum to be who needed a saviour. She knew herself she needed a saviour. And she knew her son would be that saviour. Only twice in my Christian life have I had such an awakening as that. Forgive me. His blood spilt just at the time God passes over to judge the sins of man. Incredible. Every sin before that moment, at that moment, and after that moment, covered by Christ's blood. There's Christians, all of us here, we know and understand, redeemed, restored, reconciled. We understand that, don't you? Now I discovered a wee hymn and a favorite hymn book of mine. It's in the Believers. Fortunate that we still have my father-in-law's Believers book at home. No, I always turn to a favourite hymn of mine, number 96, Jehovah's a Kenyan, you know the one. The wee hymn after it, number 97, this is a fantastic little hymn. Let me read to you verses 1 and 3, and then I'll read verse 2 to you. I saw the cross of Jesus when burdened with my sin. I sought the cross of Jesus to give me peace within. I thought my sins, I believed them in his blood. And on the cross of Jesus, I found my peace with God. Then we jump to verse 3. Sweet is the cross of Jesus. There let my weary heart still rest in peace unshaken, till with him near to part. And then in strains of glory, I will sing his wondrous power, where sin can never enter, and death is known no more. But it's verse 2. Let me read verse 2 to you. I love the cross of Jesus. It tells me of what I am, a vile and, gil- vile and guilty creature saved only through the Lamb. No righteousness, no merit, no beauty can I plead. Here in the cross I glory. My title there I read. Restored, redeemed, reconciled. That, brothers and sisters, is our Passover. That's our Passover right there in that verse. Now, for those of us that are Christians here, we all know and understand that. We all know that this service and all our services are recorded. I don't know who's watching this. But if you're watching this this evening and you don't know Christ, well, you have an opportunity right now to have your metaphorical doorposts and lintels covered by the blood of the Lamb. You do. To have the judgment of God pass over you, to have his wrath pass you by. That's what the Passover was. Not just a new start, but to have God's judgment and wrath removed. The blood of Jesus washing you whiter than white. We're not just presented with the wrath of God. We're presented with his mercy. And mercy through his son who was on the cross and at the same point of suffering God's wrath, he gave us mercy. This isn't just grace or salvation. It's outrageous grace. It's outrageous salvation. It's grace and salvation on steroids. If you can accept Jesus became the Passover lamb, that he came to ensure that you can be given for your sins, if you can accept that, if you can accept that, if you can accept you've got sin in your life that's holding you back, Wearing you down. If you can accept that Christ came, can you accept Christ came to take you from that sin? Will you accept him as Lord and Saviour? Will you? Can you accept that only he can remove that sin? 
Trust me when I say he will remove it. He will be that shelter that ensures that the wrath and judgment of God will pass over you. This is what the Passover means today. Can you accept that? Can you? Now, as I finish, Colin is going to play uh, a hymn for us. If you want to sit back and listen to it, you may want to join in. You may not. You may want to just listen. And when the Colin fades the hymn down, Ali's going to come back and close the service for us. Thank you. <laughs>